Don't look now, Giant fans, but the New York Giants are in the postseason after making short work of the Indianapolis Colts 38 to 10. Former NFL scout David Turner and I break it all down for you coming up next on the Locked On Giants podcast. You are Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of the Lock on Giants podcast is brought to you by Ultimate Football GM. Ever dreamed of becoming an NFL GM and managing your own football franchise? Then this game is definitely for you. To download the game, just visit ultimate-gm.com or look it up on the app stores. Our listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo code LOCKON, that's in all caps, by the way, in the game. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome. We have postseason, ladies and gentlemen. It's the Lock on Giants podcast. I'm Patricia Traina, joined by former NFL scout David Turner. The Giants are in the postseason, but first we've got to talk about their 38-10 to win over the Indianapolis Colts. Now, look, let's be honest. The Colts came into this game not a very good team. They had some big, big time problems on offense the Giants able to capitalize on it but David I think we saw some very encouraging things regardless that certainly this team can build on moving forward and we're going to talk about those today and I think we got to start with the quarterback wouldn't you say (laughs) sure we can start with Daniel um you know I thought he was very impressive obviously 19 to 24 at 177 not like stellar ooh but numbers right but he was consistent he took care of the ball he knew when to run he knew when to pull it down when to check down he made very good decisions today his quarterback rating was like 125 or something like that so um two touchdowns so again very impressive steady eddie in performance which we you know expect out of him for for 90 percent of this season that's what we got and that's what we've gotten from him so it's it's really on par with where he's at and again, Dable did a good job. Him and Kafka did a good job mixing in some quarterback runs today as they were given to him. You know, I, I think late in the game, I got a little bit like, hey, knock it off. And I text you at one point. I was like, okay, enough with the running the ball, Daniel. Like, we don't need to get a late injury here. Um, but, you know, I think he, him himself was feeling it. He pulled a couple balls, I think, late where he was like, I can do this. And that's great to see. I, I love to see the competitor in him. I really do because he's such an even keel guy. So when he does do a few of those things, I get fired up. And I know it probably fires up the bench and everybody. But same point, we got to play between the ears better because late in the game, when you have the game won, let's just give the ball to your playmakers and let them go make plays. Keep yourself safe. And, you know, again, you're in the playoffs. So it's not you're not just playing this week or next week you definitely have another game so you got to you got to keep yourself healthy with that but i thought all in all today was a very good day from daniel jones and the whole offense in, entirely david you used to be a gm at one point i think in the cfl or afl or something like that so i'm assistant ask- gm i've never got the chair but yeah i was assistant, assistant GM. gm all right yep. well you still you had the gm uh mentality <laughs> so i've i've got to ask you this when you look at Daniel Jones's numbers, they're not eye popping. No. So there was a report by the NFL Network that the Giants want to sign Daniel Jones to a long term deal, multi year deal, um, if they can agree to a price. When you look at you know setting a market value, how how do you come up with it? I mean, do you look at stats as a comparison? Do you look at the overall picture? What factors go into? Do you think determining what the market value is going to be. I mean, the obvious thing would be stats, which, you know, if that's the case, then you could probably make a case to, you know, shortchange them. But I'm, I'm sure there's other things that go into it. All in all, you got to put into play what the organizational values are versus market value, okay? And there are organizations that fear losing the quarterback because that's their bread and butter and that's their 
ticket to success and it helps them sell tech tickets and it helps them sell marketing and you know they just want that name in that seat okay daniel's not that guy you know he's not a brett Favre, a peyton manning <laughs> dan marino so you don't really have to fear that if you lose daniel jones okay He's not an Eli, you know, even Eli there, well, I wouldn't say it was a huge marketing draw, but he was a draw. People enjoyed Eli and people enjoyed watching Eli play. And uh, Daniel has had such a question mark through his career. I do not think that that would be a, a loss for the organization. Now you start to look at the, um, the numbers in comparison to the free agent market and the draftable choices coming up. And then you say, where, where would he fall in that marketplace? And the combined two. Because if you just look at one, like say the draft, and you say, oh, we can, we're, we're in line, we'll be able to draft somebody, you know, no, because there's development, there's process there, there's a lot of things. You have to look at the combined market. And when you look at the combined free agent and draft market, how does he fare there? And when I look at Daniel Jones, I thought they should have gave him a deal before this season because, honestly, the way he fit into Dabo's system and the way Dabo calls offense and everything, as you heard in preseason shows, go back and listen to when I did this with Patricia, I said Dabo's going to tailor something for him. He's going to look really good this year. And I was a big fan of this marriage with this head, this, uh, head coach and this quarterback. So I think we're seeing it play out. I do think next year Daniel can take a further step forward if the receiver core becomes more consistent and we have the talent in which he deserves to be around him. This year it's been such a mass unit, it's hard for him to really get into rhythm, though we saw some rhythm today with him and um, Richie James and Hodges and and uh, Slayton didn't get as targeted as much as I like. Bellinger, though, got three targets for 42 yards, which I was a, I'm a big fan of. Like That should be his wheelhouse each and every week. If that tight end gets that kind of production each and every week for this offense, it's going to open up so much more for Daniel. So I'm, I'm a big fan of those play calls and targets for the, the tight end. Um, but again, I think when you look at the market in general, I would probably, and I'm not trying to talk, I, I'll be honest, I have not talked to the Giants inside the building. So this is just my opinion because you asked the question. I didn't even know you were going to ask me this question. So I'm just running through it in my brain as we're talking through it here. And you know me, I'm thinking through it. I'd probably go in and look at the, 15th to 11th style quarterbacks contracts in the league. And I would range something inside there where his base pay might land him about 13th. And then with incentive playoff bonuses, um, team MVPs, even, you know, things of that nature starts uh, bonuses that we could boost him into like the ninth range or something of that nature. And, and ultimately so I can keep the rest of the team together too because when you start bringing in those kind of numbers, even at that value, you're, it's going to be you're going to you're going to lose out. You're going to have to let some people go or restructure some people. Um, I know people are like, "Well, you're talking about the 12th, 13th, yeah," but it's a boost from where his rookie contract is. So it, that kind of boost is going to make you have other decisions. I think he's played into that style of contract, and if he would give us that a four year deal at that price. I'm I'm positive he would earn more on the next go around in the next deal. And that's where I would just put his focus for us as an organization. Makes sense. That's about where I was thinking too, because I've started to try to play around with contract numbers for Daniel Jones. I want to talk about Daniel's ability to elevate this receiver core. I mean, Richie James, Isaiah Hodgins, they're not household names. Richie James caught seven of seven pass targets for 76 yards and a touchdown. Hodgins, four of five for 42 yards and a touchdown. Bellinger had three of three, 42 yards. Uh, Slayton, two of three for 14. I mean, what is it that Daniel is doing that is just making these guys look so much better than maybe what, what they were thought to be? Well, again, Hodges has come in and become – an incredible value receiver, big, tall, strong hands, willing to go across the middle, you know, tough guy that I, I've enjoyed seeing. Uh, I didn't know him, obviously, before he hit the field. He was just on the practice squad of the Bills, so I didn't really know who he was. But when he hit the field, wow, he's really 
and and he's getting better each and every week. He's got some good route running, but for Daniel, his ball placement is really well right now. It's he's putting it when he like today when he had Hodgins going across the middle, he put it into his body. You know, he didn't make him extend for it. He didn't put it to in a place where he had to reach down for it, you know, which would have exposed his back or his head. You know, it was right on his shoulder, chest plate area on the right side. So the, the player was comfortable taking the hit behind him, but also making that tough catch across the middle for him. I mean, that sounds little, but I'll tell you this. A lot of receivers, they respect the heck out of that one because it's like, man, you put it right in the right spot where I can catch it and protect myself. So I'll go across the middle for you. You're going to protect me like that. I mean, those tough catches are there. The safeties are lying in wait. And, you know, I have to, in my job, take that. I have to take that hit. But you can protect me by putting that ball right on that chest plate shoulder area. And Daniel did that today. Um, with R Richie James, I mean, I think Richie's been spending some time on the jugs machine because earlier he was dropping some balls. And, you know, I think he's out there working on catching and securing the ball and, Early in the year, he uh, fumbled two punts, but it seems like the fumble ice has gone away. So, you know, that's awesome. It's good to see um, him do that. Uh, but for those catches that he he had today, again, he, he put it in position. Daniel put it in position where the, play, the player can run with the ball after the catch. And, you know, he put it in a good spot. He didn't make him elevate, climb the ladder, pluck it out of the air. It was just a simple, you know, pop up and catch, you know, use use my hands and then run with it. So Daniel's ball placement has been really well over the – I mean, I think it's been there pretty much most of the season. Like I said, 90% of the season. There's been a couple games where I'm like, ooh, you know, ooh. But that most of the season, 90% that we've seen so far, Daniel's really gotten better at his ball placement and his delivery points for these receivers to make really comfortable catches. Let's talk about the running game now. You know, Jones was the leading rusher, 91 yards on 11 carries, had two rushing touchdowns. But the Giants also, uh, rather than overload Saquon Barkley, he only got 12 uh, touches for 58 yards. Breida got nine for 59 yards. And Gary Brightwell, five for nine. Do you like that the Giants are spreading it out a little bit more as opposed to overloading Saquon? I mean, I think they're probably doing that to keep Saquon fresh now that they're headed for the playoffs. But, you know, do you agree with that or 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 do you think that they should give Saquon the 15, 20 carries to get him going? I love the division and plan for the division of carries. I would subtract seven away from Daniel. <laughs> Leaving him with four and then um, put one more on Brita and then the other ones on Saquon. You know, I like Saquon around 20 carries, 18 to 22, 25 carries a game. That's where I would like him. Um, I would like Daniel, like you said, around four, five carries a game and Brita right around that, that nine to 12 carries a game and Brightwell again, five to five to seven is perfect for him too. I think it's really a great, I would have loved to see the wildcat today. Hell, I would love to see all three backs in the backfield with Daniel spread out at one point. That would be fun to watch, you know, and a little bit of a pistol style formation. They wouldn't know what would go on. So, you know, I, I think they have some characters there in which they can, um, they can create a really good script with. And I love the division of the runs. It's I don't believe it's just to keep Saquon fresh. I think it's also to change it up. I mean, Brita had some gashers today. I mean, he averaged 6.6 .6 yards a carry, and his longest was 18. So, I mean, that's perfect for him. And Brightwell came in and pounded the rock. He's a bigger dude. Let him pound that rock. Like, get it. You know what I mean? So I'm all about the way they divided up the the runs today, except for Daniel to me just ran a little too much at the end there. Uh, I would have liked to seen those go back to Barkley or to Brita or someone else. All right, coming up. But no Z fly motions. No Z fly motions. <laughs> okay. All right, coming up, we're going to talk about the defensive effort against that Colts offense, which, you know, I don't want to say they were bad, but – the numbers kind of speak for themselves. So don't go anywhere. We know what we'll number right we're going to talk about first. <laughs> Hang on. All right, folks, we'll be right back after this. Hey, Giant fans, have you ever wanted to show the NFL GMs how it's really done? Well, now you can by hooking up with Ultimate Football GM, where you have the final say over every aspect of your roster. 
Among the decisions you can make include hiring the coaches and coordinators, making trades, drafting, and free agency. All of this in a challenging and realistic game world. Ultimate Football GM is completely free and playable offline. You play on the go as you want and when you want. We at the Locked On NFL Network are already competing against each other, and we're having an absolute blast. We know you will, too, when you compete against your friends. So go ahead and get started. Locked On Giants podcast listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo code Locked On in the game store. To download the game, just visit ultimate-gm.com or look it up on the app stores. That's ultimate-gm.com, Ultimate Football GM. Start your dynasty today. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Locked On Giants podcast. You got Patricia Trana, former NFL scout David Turner. We are breaking down the Giants' big playoff clinching. Boy, that sounds so good. Playoff clinching. Just let that soak in. Clinching. Clinching. And they got a game to go. Like they, they're firmly in the sixth spot, and they got a game to go. To go. Exactly. So. In this segment, we're going to talk about the defense. Now, the Colts offense, let's call it for what it is. They're not having a very good year on the Colts offense. And I'm being nice. They were they they were pretty bad. Um, offensive line, the quarterback in play, just nothing was going right for the Colts. But that being said, the Giants defense came with came in with a plan. And we got to start, I think, talking about uh Kayvon Thibodeau. That five train. You're talking about that five train coming in. Now, Lawrence Taylor. All right. Lawrence Taylor was at the game today. He he rang the victory bell or that that bell at the beginning of the uh, of the um the game that they like to have a legend ring. And I've seen some people say that Thibodeau has the ability to influence a game like Lawrence Taylor, which I think is kind of a stretch right now, given what Lawrence did in his career versus where Thibodeau is. He's only, you know, in his first year. But in this game, you certainly saw Thibodeau, you know, imposing his will on the team. I mean, what is – where has he taken the biggest jump, do you think, in in his in this first season of his? That five train came home today consistently in the backfield. He came to play, and he played all day long. Um, that five train is so amazing. I love him. So, I'm, I mean, he should trademark that, the five train, because that's what he is. He's the number five train coming in, and he's going to make it, wreck, wreck havoc. Um, you know, back in the day when we had Strahan, we had, uh, was it Pierre, Paul, and Tuck, and them, right? We, we, had, all, uh, we had all of them, and Ozzy, Ozzy Humanera coming off the edge, all that, right? I mean, they, they called them like the, the NASCARs, right? It was all NASCAR, and I was – well, now you got you got 97, 5, 51, and 99. It is a train, baby. They are coming heavy, and they are coming hard, and they are running that rail all dang day. So I'm telling you, it's a subway series at the quarterback. I am loving him so much because what he's getting is comfortable in his own athletic ability. In college, he was about to get there his senior year, and he got hurt. And then the beginning of this year, he got hurt. So he was, he's been playing a little timid. He's been playing a little bit, uh, I don't want to say um, out of sorts, because it's not really out of sorts. It's, it's more of just like, should I do that? Should I not do that? My body could do that, but is that the right thing, coach? You know, today and I think last week, I wasn't able to come back on here with you last week because of the holidays and stuff. But what I saw were just more of him being unleashed. Like he's confident. His confidence is growing. And this young man has all the ability in the world uh, as far as athleticism, length, speed, um, change of direction. Like, it's all there. Um, great bend, great everything. You know, that he almost had that interception today and went to the house if he would have caught that ball, you know. So um, it's just confidence. The more confidence he comes with, the better his game will get. Compared to Lawrence, Lawrence played with un – I mean, Lawrence was just a demon. I mean, he played with reckless abandonment on every play. Like, he didn't care if he hit one person or ten people. He was hitting people every play. You know, Thibodeau's not that guy. 
He's not that guy. He need, He's a little bit more intellectual. He needs to have the plan down and know it. Um, whereas I think Lawrence was a lot more instinctual and just like, I know I got this. I'm just, I'm going to, don't talk to me. I'm going to get this guy, you know, like <laughs> it was a lot more intense than Thibodeau. Um, but I, I think they're both going to, I mean, obviously Lawrence is into the record books for being who he is and, and how he is, um, you know, LT forever will be known and talked about as one of the greatest pass rushers the game has ever seen. You know, when we talk about pass rushers, he's in the top five, if not top two, right, in some people's opinion. Thibodeau has a long way to get there, but he has a lot of the tools and athletic ability and capabilities to get there. And, you know, I am I am thoroughly enjoying him and watching his, um, his him maturing. I think this offseason will be great for him because he'll be able to be around a little bit more, learn a little bit more, uh, work on his health and, you know, well-being a little bit more. And I think next year, you know, him and and 51 and 99 and 97, if we can keep them all and get them all going and put some linebackers behind them, I mean, it can get really silly really quick. The Giants had Xavier McKinney in the lineup, which was kind of a surprise. I mean, nobody really thought he would be in the lineup. I think Dable didn't even think he would be in the lineup, you know. But, of course, he got better um, and showed enough to be in the lineup. What were the Giants missing with him out of the lineup, and what did he bring this week? I think you saw the secondary lineup consistently in the right spots. I think that leadership back, he's kind of the alpha dog back there. And, you know, I thought Collins might come in and, you know, bark his way into it. But McKinney today really was like, he was lining them up and he had them in the right spots. We didn't see a lot of mental busts today. You know, we didn't see people out of place. We, I mean, let's give them, I mean, they didn't give up that many yards. I mean, look at it. They only gave up 144 yards throwing um, and only 17 completions. This is an NFL team, guys. I mean, they get paid to play too, and they only completed 17 balls today. So, um, you know, Pittman was their main guy, only had 41 yards. Yeah, he had a touchdown late. But, um, you know, he was targeted eight times, caught six for 41. Campbell, their second guy, was targeted six and had three catches for 52. So, again, I, I thought they played a lot better um, with the pre-snap alignments, which put them in better position when the play, you know, took off. Um, we didn't see people looking back or looking around like, where should you be, you know, or well, that's your guy. I thought there was a lot more confidence back there and having him there I, it was a big part of it in my in my viewpoint from where I sat. Interesting. So when he was out, I think Julian Love was making the calls back there. You, you sensed there was more... Uh, confusion with Julian Love making the calls? I wouldn't say confusion. I just don't think it – there's a tonology, right? There's a tonology when you have the alpha dog in the backfield and when you don't. So it just snaps you to attention a little bit more when when the main guy's back there making the calls. You know, I think Love had him in good position most of the time. But, again, there were a few plays each game where it looked like there was just like, hey, I thought that was – or wait, wait. You know, there was conversation after plays, put it that way. Today I didn't see conversation after plays. So, to me, that that gave me an indication of what's changed. Oh, he's back there. Okay. And then, you know, when he was directing people, you just saw him trust the calls too. And I'm not, that's not bagging on love. I just think it was a more snap to situation where they trusted everything with him back there, which is exactly what we need going into the playoffs. Yeah. And I mean, of, of course, they hopefully they get uh, Adoree Jackson back because, you know, this week they were able to get away with it. Next week against the Eagles, they're probably going to want to have Jackson back if they can get him. They're certainly going to want to have him for the playoffs because. Uh, uh, I mean, yes and no. Because the Why Eagles, well, because the Eagles might rest players next week. The reality, no, they is, won't, because they, they have they haven't clinched the first seed, so they've got they've got. Well, that's next that, week. well. I was just about to go there. I was about to say that. Um, you know, depending on the situation with the Niners, right? And because we saw Minnesota today, holy, holy, oh, that was a mess. Mm -hmm. Um. But Minnesota's you know, not again, as good as their record. <laughs> what? 
I, I don't know that Minnesota is as good as their record indicates. No. And if they're going on the road, um, they're going to have a real hard time. So the one time, the one game they're going to get at home is going to be uh, a must win for them. And then they're going to pray that others lose <laughs> so they can get a second one at home. But um, what I'm just going to say is the Eagles, I mean, we, Minshew did not look good today. Okay. And, and last time we faced the Eagles, we didn't face Minshew. We faced Hurts. So I don't see Hurts playing in this game no matter what. Um, and being honest, even if it's first place in, in – if first place is in the in factor, I would, I would think it a coaching mistake to play him because here's the thing. An extra week of West rest for him is big, and if they can get the first place without him – then it gives them the buy too. Um, all that rest matters to to the kind of injury in which he has. If he goes out there and Big ninety seven hits him hard and and falls on him, you know if Lawrence gets a hold of him, uh, that's their playoffs. That's their that's their season. He's done. So I I wouldn't risk it, me personally. So I think we'll face Min- Minshew. Um, and when you got him back there, it's a whole different call sheet it's a different play calling sheet and everything um you don't have to worry about the running from the quarterback position as much and everything else so you know again i think we'll be in a position where if that's the case they might just say you know what it's not worth risking you know brown and smith you know let's just let's just see if we can win the game with 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 our guys versus try to get people hurt because they're good enough to to be the second seed and still go to the Super Bowl. You know, the Eagles are. But if you go into that last game and the Giants are fighting to be in there and you're fighting and it's a it's a big game, people get hurt, you're going to, as a coach, you're going to look stupid. Yeah, I mean, I, I still say the Eagles, you know, because they haven't sewed up the that bye week that I don't know that they're going to necessarily rest everybody. And I, I don't know, I mean – I think they want the bye week and I can't see them, you know, not, I guess I could see them, you know, playing hurts a little bit, but probably going to be touch and go there. I would think, but let's, let's go back to the defense, um, the giants defense. What did you see from the run defense this week? I mean, Lynn, I thought Landon Collins has just been amazing, Um, but they held, let me see. They held, the uh, the Colts to 128 yards on 27 carries, you know, not great, but not horrible. What we've seen in the past. Um, do you see the run defense getting a little bit better, or is it still a problem in your mind? I didn't break down the first half rush versus second half rush, but I think the first half rush is where we got gashed a little bit more. In the second half, obviously they were playing from behind, so they had to throw a little bit more. Um, but the same point, I think we sewed it up a little bit better in the second half. Um, that all being said, you know, we didn't face Jonathan Taylor. We didn't face, you know, the Colts <laughs> real offense, which, you know, was, led the league in rushing and stuff last year, right? So um, I think what we saw was, you know, an average run offense, and we were able to, to limit it to it, you know, to its carries and everything. If we find if we find ourselves in against an elite rush offense, we're still going to have some problems because the middle linebackers are not taking aggressive ang- angles downhill. What they're doing is they're really kind of playing laterally, and that's going to cause that's going to cause ability to get to the second level by the offensive line. And when you get that second level block, NFL running backs pop for big yards. So you know, for me. Um, I would like to see Smith and them play downhill better, um, take more aggressive angles to meet the blockers as well as the backs in the holes. Um, Collins is doing that. And on the outside, he's filling that outside lane really well. So we're seeing him come up and create piles and messes and you know just hit people, and that's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Um, but, again, if our middle linebackers aren't also doing that, it's going to be an it's going to be an issue when we find an when we run into an elite running team. Yeah, definitely. All right, going to take our final break. When we come back, I've got some questions I'm going to put to you. So get ready. We'll be right <laughs> back after this. Hey, giant fans! If you haven't tried Built Bars yet, you're absolutely depriving yourself of one of life's greatest joys. These protein bars are covered in real milk chocolate. They taste great. 
There's no chemical taste or aftertaste or anything like that. They're available in several different flavors and they're good for you. They're low in sugar and carbs and high in protein. And some of them also have collagen protein, which is really, really good for you. So this year, if you want to eat something that tastes good and is good for you, you've got to try Bilt Bar. And here's the best part. Now you no longer have to wait around for an order to ship from Bilt.com. That's right. Head on over to your local Sam's Club or Walmart and pick up your box today. Hey, Giant fans, thanks so much for making the Locked On Giants podcast your first listen every day. Subscribe to the Locked On NFL podcast and get daily conversations on the biggest NFL stories. Plus, get in-depth analysis on the biggest games with NFL key predictions every Friday. And Monday, local insiders cover the weekend with game-to-game episodes. Locked On NFL, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Locked On Giants podcast, postseason edition. Well, actually, we're not quite in the postseason, but we're headed there. We we're on the road. There. We are on we're the road. On the we're road. on the yeah. road. We're not hitchhiking. We are firmly on the road. Yes, yes. It's getting there. Still one more game to go. And, of course, we're talking about uh, the most current game, which was the 38-10 win by the New York Giants. All right, David, I've got some questions for you. Uh-oh. So here's here's the thing. The Giants have scored 72 points in their last two games after posting just 256 points all of last year. Is this Giants offense playing its best ball right now? No, it can be better. How so? Uh, familiarity with the receivers, consistency at the tight end, and commitment by the coaches of running the football. If we were to see that, this the Giants offense has the ability to be a consistent – 28 point a game type type team if you know between 28 and 31 type every game um it really does but we need the consistency out of the receivers the commitment to run the ball from the coaches and the um the health to stay there with the receivers tight ends and stuff of that nature do you look at this offense and kind of say that you know because it's year one for everybody that they've kind of i don't want to say dumbed it down for daniel jones and company but there are things that they're not doing, like they're not taking a lot of deep shots down the field, or is that just because of the personnel they have? I believe it's more personnel because when we saw early in the season, um, when we had everybody healthy, um, they did take more shots, I thought, and they were trying to open up the vertical game, um, especially, was it the second, the first game against the Dallas Cowboys? I want to say we opened up that vertical game a little bit and then people got hurt, right? So um, it to me, it's personnel driven. It's we don't have that really bang deep shot guy, and we're not having a um, consistency like we were early in the year. So yeah, it's that can it's that personnel grouping. What about on defense? Do you think this defense is peaking right now? No, it can be better. The run, besides the run, what else can they can they be doing? The pass rush can be better. The pass rush can absolutely be better. We're not getting what we need to out of 99 and 51 consistently. 97 and 5 are coming on strong, and they are, they are, they are, I can't say that word. They're monsters. Um, <laughs> so, you know, they are definitely causing havoc consistently in the backfield, both 5 and 97. If we can get 99 and 51 to play up to their level, it will be better. If Smith on his run, if we can find a way to isolate Smith on pass rushes versus running backs, when we know the running back is going to be picking up the blitz, uh, we would be better because Smith is very good coming downhill against running backs, especially A gap, B gap type rushes. He does very well with a, a very linear north south rush that way. So that's a way we can definitely isolate the back and uh, get a pass rush out of Smith. If he knows that that third and 11, they usually have the back pick him up. Now we can run a game with Smith inside. Um, I think as far as coverage wise, we can be better. We can be more consistent. Like you said, if we get Jackson back from health, we get, you know, we have all our healthy guys back in there, Love and McKinney and, you know, whatever, you know, everybody back there, we can get better. 
Um, so I don't think we're peaking yet. I think if the health of the secondary gets better, the defense gets better too. What about coaching? Are they hitting their stride right now? Or are there things that they could do better? I think they have their reins on them because of the limitation with the personnel groupings and way they're, they, they kind of have, um, they have the restrictor plates on. <laughs> to use a NASCAR term, <laughs> they have the restrictor plates on because they don't have all the people they thought they were going to have going into the season at the positions and places they were going to have them. So they, they've had to idle back if the health comes and the consistency comes over, you know, from this week to next week and then into the first week of the playoffs. I think you'll see the coaches take some of those, uh, loosen that restrictor plate a little bit and do a little bit more. But right now they're doing the best with what they got. I, I really I can they do things a little different and tinker with it? Absolutely. They need to do that each and every week. But I don't think they they'll be able to really take the restrictor plates off the rest of this year just because of injury and personnel groups. All right. Now here's the million dollar question. Ooh, I get a million dollars. Here we go. <laughs> if you're Brian Dable, how do you treat next week's game knowing that win or lose, you're not going to improve your standing? Um, there's always the risk of somebody getting hurt. Do you play your starters or do you sit them or do you maybe come to some kind of middle of the road type of deal? I'm a very competitive individual and that's a hard question because this is my divisional opponent. And if I give them the game, they get the number one seed in the division, giving them a buy and giving them the ability to have the road to the Super Bowl go through Philadelphia. I don't want to do that if I'm the Giants. I don't want to play through Philadelphia. Like, I'd rather play through San Francisco or play through Minnesota or wh whoever's in the running for it. I'd rather play somewhere else than have to go through Philly. And everybody's like, but it's an East Coast team. Like, it's that's no, it's my divisional opponent. I want to take them out of that seat. And if I'm in the week and I know they're not going to play Hurts and they're going to play Minshew and, the, you know, I'm going to win. I'm going in there to win. Now, if it's like the last Philly game and it starts to get crazy and, you know, we're, we're down by a bunch, am I sitting starters by the end of the third quarter? Yeah. I'll pop pull them and, and just let the fourth qu quarter happen because, like you said, it doesn't matter and there's no sense of getting somebody hurt. And at that point, we're probably going to, uh, you know, Minnesota to play the Vikings. So why, why hurt anybody? But if I got a chance to win the game, and go into the go into the um, the playoffs on a hot streak, winning a couple games in a row, and you know making the Giants, you know, a ten and was it they'd be ten and six and one at that point. I'm doing that because it's been a long time since this New York Giants team and organizations had a ten win season. So I'm giving that to the ownership. They gave me my chance. I'm going to give them a ten win ten win season. Like that's something that – that's a benchmark that's always been in the NFL. You want to get 10 wins. And if I can give them 10 wins, I'm going to do it. Plus you want to stick it to Philly, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and I got some good friends that work there, but they know. <laughs> they already know. They already know. Yeah. What do you think needs to change, get better, or, or you know, drastically improve as the Giants, you know, once they get to, into the postseason? I don't think they need to drastically do anything drastically. I think they need to work work their offense, just consistently work their offense and their defense. Um, you know, I, I we haven't seen all these players play together consistently. Like, if you were to do an injury breakdown, I mean, Billinger missed a bunch of time at tight end, right? Then we don't have the receivers that we stepped on the field to, that we would start with. Now we have Hodgins and James and Slayton, who seem to be our main three. You know, we just need to play with those guys and keep them going. Um, we got to rotate and, and utilize, div divvy up the runs like we did with Brita and Barkley and Brightwell today. You know, we just need consistency. If we get that consistency – then we'll be good. You know, on defense, if our pass rush steps up and gets better, you know, really matures into what they can be. Like I said, 51 and 99 coming with the same energy as five and 97. That's all we're going to need. Like we'll win playoff games that way. We really will. It's people want to make it like this. You need these 
Brett Favre's or Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady type moments, you know, you really don't, you know, you can be Novocaine and win playoff games. You just have to be consistent and deliver consistently. Final question in your heart of hearts, is this giants playoff bound team a one and done team or can they maybe win a couple? Well, let's play the scenario. Right now, it looks like they'd go to Minnesota, correct? Uh huh. No, and wait. Be, no, wait. Hold up. It would be Frisco because it's it's seven and two, six and three. So it would be Frisco right now. I think unless mm -hmm. Frisco jumped ahead the of Vikings, Minnesota. Nope. The Vikings are three. The Vikings are three. All right. So then it would be the Vikings. So we go to Minnesota. We know we can win there, right? Yep. Okay. So we beat Minnesota. Cowboys would play the Buccaneers. And mm -hmm. just for uh, giggles, Seahawks say the Seahawks make it in. Um, but it looks like it really looks like Green Bay is going to wind up that we're taking that. So let's say Green Bay. Green Bay makes it in. They go to the Niners. So you got mm -hmm. Green Bay and the Niners, which will be <laughs> a hard fought game out in, you know, no weather because it's going to be out in the Bay Area. It might be wet, but it isn't going to be messy. So um, if we win, well, when we win, we beat the Vikings then that would put us in this position that we would be the sixth seed. If Green Bay were to beat the Niners, Green Bay would go play Philly, and we would be in a situation to probably play either Dallas or the Buccaneers, right? Mm -hmm. Now, my feeling is that we can beat the Buccaneers. I've watched them enough this year. We can definitely beat the Buccaneers, and we can beat Dallas. I'm not scared of either one of those teams. Like, I know people are like, how can you not – I'm not. I'm not scared of either one of those teams. Um, if we're healthy and we're in those games healthy, uh, I'm not scared of either the Bucks or the Cowboys. So I could see that both those matchups being in our favor. Now, if we had to go out to San Francisco or we had to go play Philly, those are very tough games. And, you know, we would have to be very motivated to win. Those are good football teams right now. They are playing hard. But the, the Raiders today played the, you know, Niners into overtime, and they took them to the limit. And the Giants, to me, have a very good team um, that matches up. I think our defense is better than the Raiders' defense. So, you know, for me, without Debo Samuels, the Niners team becomes a lot more. And with Prudy versus, you know, their other quarterbacks, that, that Niner team is – is beatable. So if they can survive Green Bay and it would be us going out there to them, that, that Green Bay bat battle is going to be very tough on them. So again, I see us having an opportunity, a very likely opportunity to be in two games this year in the playoffs, um, just depending on how the cards fall and how they lay. But if that's how they lay, I, I like our opportunity in those two games. I like the chances against the Vikings for sure. <clears throat> I think, you know, they almost beat them. Um, they should have beaten them. And uh, again, the Vikings, despite the record, I, it, it just, to me, I watched the Vikings in that game and the, and, and the play just doesn't match the record. I'm not really sure why, but. Um, but the Vikings are, the Vikings are a very good home team. Take the climate out of it team. And that's where we're going to have to play them. Right, we're gonna have to play them at their house in in the climate dome. We just hope this the schedule falls where we play them at night because cousins doesn't like playing at night <laughs> for some reason. So that would be good. Um, I guess his sleep number bed isn't you know tuned in for him to play at night or something. I don't know. But that all being said, yeah. I I think it would be a good situation for us to play them, and it would be a really good matchup. Like you said, we should have beat them in the in the first matchup. So. Uh, Wink and Dable, I think, will learn from their mistakes and be able to go in there with a really, really competitive game plan. And I think they want them to. I get the impression, you know, the early impression that they would like that to be the case. I mean, certainly, I think it would be better a better matchup than the 49ers because now you got to go all the way across the country and, you know, the time's difference and ugh, who needs that, right? Yeah, but the Niners today, like I watched the whole game because I'm out here on the West Coast, and I watched that whole game. I watched a lot of Niner games out this way. And while I like Brock Purdy and what he's doing, he's missing reads and missing throws. And, you know, Devontae Adams is just just slashed them. But they ran, they ran, the Raiders ran the ball really, really well against the Niners today. It was the number one rushing offense. 
but they ran the ball against them and they, they exposed a lot of power run game stuff. So, you know, for me, without Debo having to defend Debo and the rest of that, you know, the rest of the offense is good. Obviously Christian is Christian, but without Debo, that's, that's an X factor that really is like, wow, they, they miss him a lot. And Prudy misses the throw consistently, just the read more than the throw. I should say the read and in Wink's defense with the pressure that would cause, I think him some confusion. Yeah. Well, listen, it's going to be interesting. I, 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 I know when I looked at it earlier, um, obviously the, the 49ers were still playing, so I wasn't sure, you know, what the order was. But now that I see it, I'm like, hmm, good opportunity here. By the way, the Giants are a 13-point dog against the uh, the Eagles next week. I'm going to go bet that right now. <laughs> Can I say that on air? <laughs> you, you're you're going to take that? I'm going to – heck, yeah. Give me – Actually, wait, took, bro, today I took the Broncos with a 13 point dog against Kansas City. <laughs> yeah, here it is. Okay, for per our friends at Bet Online, the Giants are a 13 point underdog. The over under is 40 and a half. I'll take the over and the Giants with 13 points. Thank you very much. Wow. I think that's the biggest – I'm just looking real quick. I think that's the biggest spread or opening spread next week. Yeah. Oh, no, Arizona at, at Frisco. That That's a 13. And when I say the Giants were 13 and a half? No, minus 13. Okay. So, yeah, that's going to be interesting to say the least. So, hey, all I right. Had a, I had a, I had an 18 parlay today, and I almost had a 10. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> I am – I am – I am fine with that stuff. But, yeah, when you give me the Giants plus 13 in Philly with Minshew probably at quarterback, I'll take it. Probably. I mean, we'll see how that line moves as the, as the week goes on. Maybe it shrinks if Minshew, you know, if, if Hurts isn't going to It'll probably get down to eight and a half. They'll sort of give it to him. If Hurts plays, that line will hold firmer. But if Hurts doesn't play, then I think it'll shrink down to like eight and a half or six and a half even. Yeah, I think But if right. I can get it right now at 13, I'll take it. <laughs> well we'll see how it goes obviously so all right my friend that's going to do it for us on today's episode of the locked on giants podcast is always great stuff it is so great talking about playoffs coming up i mean one more game to go i get it can't look ahead but now we can officially talk about playoffs and it is just absolutely exciting and i cannot wait to see what happens next week hopefully the giants play the eagles a little tougher and beat them, that would be really nice. I'd love to beat them in their own house. I would love that. Um, and then it's off to uh, something we haven't seen in six years, and that's the postseason. And it's going to be really, really exciting, and I can't wait. Absolutely. I'm excited for it. Um, I'm so happy to be doing these with you. And I and I just want to say, everybody, you know, Happy New Year. Obviously, it's New Year's Day today. And um, Merry Christmas, because I didn't get to do it last week. Uh, you know, I hope everybody had a great safe holiday uh, season this year. Well said, my friend. All right, Giant fans, that's going to do it for us here on the Locked on Giants podcast. We've got Twitter Tuesday tomorrow, so you know the drill. Send in those questions. The info is in the show notes or tweet them at me with the hashtag AskPTrade and we'll get them on the show. We'll probably have a nice big mailbag. No worries. We're celebrating all week because the Giants are in the playoffs and I'm happy and I'm even happier to do the Twitter Tuesday mailbags with you. So make sure you tune in all this week on the Locked on Giants podcast as we bring you the coverage, continued coverage of the Giants surprising but yet delightful quests. For David Turner, I'm Patricia Trainer. We will see you tomorrow, Giant fans.